Good morning, everybody. Let me begin by saying uh, happy Pride Month. I hope everybody's uh, doing well and, uh, and happy Saturday morning <clears throat> on this June uh, 3rd, 3rd rather, uh, Saturday morning. Uh, my name is Joe Sims. Uh, for those of you who haven't met me, um, I'm an officer of the uh, CPUSA National Committee, um, and I am really, really happy to be able to uh, join you in this conversation this morning. And uh, we're going to go over um, working class approaches to concepts of collectivity, um, democratic centralism, um, inner party democracy, therefore, and, and then if we have enough time, we want to talk a little bit about um, uh, collective action, collective action of the working class and how both we and other sections of our class view that. Um, and uh, so we're going to go section by section and uh, we'll take uh, questions for clarification. And then hopefully we'll have a little bit of time at the end uh, for a more general discussion. So for those of you who are just coming in again, um, happy Pride Month, um, happy Saturday morning. My name is Joe, um, and we're talking about working class approaches to collectivity, um, democratic centralism, uh, inner party democracy, therefore, but also collective action, the, the collection action of our class and where that comes from and, um, and uh, how it um, manifests itself. So let's get started. Our discussion today continues on themes introduced on Tuesday in uh, Scott Hiley's uh, excellent presentation on the role of the party. And if you haven't heard Scott's presentation um, yet, I encourage you to do so. Um, it brought forward uh, on Tuesday explicitly or implicitly but what, what, what I would call five basic features of the party, five basic features. It's working class base and leadership. Um, number one, it's a, a Marxist, Leninist, ideological orientation, worldview. Uh, number two, uh, its aim and objectives which is uh, socialism. We call it Bill of Rights socialism uh, in this country, our own uh, model. Um, and, and number three, it's relationship to the uh, press and mass media, you know. Lenin called for a party of a new type and part of the uh, ability of this new type of party uh, was its ability to intervene in struggle. In fact, that was one of its chief objectives. And if you remember from what is to be done, Lenin talked about the party and its press, its press as a collective organizer, collective mobilizer, collective propagandist. Uh, uh, so that's number four. Number five is its, its collective organizational basis and decision-making process. 
So those are the five uh, basic features of the party of a new type. Uh, and of the five, the fifth collectivity is the thing that brings it all together. It is the uh, catalytic force uh, that makes it pop. And, and, and when that happens, um, and it's popping and, and running on all five cylinders, if I can use the metaphor of a car, you have an extremely powerful engine of social progress. Um, and the thing that makes it work, uh, that makes collectivity work and, and, gives it, and gives it life is its organizational form, if you will. And that organizational form is called democratic centralism. So uh, uh, democratic centralism is the form through which collectivity expresses itself. Uh, democratic centralism is the form and uh, collectivity the essence. Uh, I don't know if those are <laughs> exactly uh, precise. Marxist categories for form and essence, but for the sake of discussion this morning, let's assume that they are. Democratic centralism is the organizing principle, and this is a little bit of shorthand, that calls for a decision-making process where there's a uh, full discussion of all proposals, you know, followed by a vote, which then binds everybody to carry out uh, the majority's uh, decision. Um, it is a political and organizational method that basically holds uh, to the principle of all for one and one for all. All for one, one for all. And you know, I was looking up that slogan the other day and I had forgotten that that slogan was uh, put forward by Alexander Dumas. Alexander Dumas was a French, Afro-French writer. He was the guy that, that wrote The Three Musketeers, if you remember uh, that, uh, that uh, novel. Um, to use an analogy uh, borrowed from sports, uh, you know, this all for one, one for all, democratic centralist concept is like a football team effort, right? You get together in a huddle, you make a plan, and then everybody on the team carries out the play, you know? Uh, keeping in mind, you know, contingencies, you know, you might fumble the ball, might get intercepted, you know, quarterback might get tackled, uh, uh, but you follow the general plan. Now, all of that uh, sounds good in theory, um, but what if um, you're not part of the huddle? You know, you came late uh, or you weren't talked to at all. Um, and so here we see that sometimes this is a principle or if you're brand new, not familiar, sometimes it's a principle that you understand might be a little bit hard to adjust to or understand. Um, I'll tell you a little story about my first experience with uh, a decision that was taken and I didn't quite get it. Um, the year was 1983. Um, uh, it was in the height of the Great Recession, uh, a cyclical downturn um, in capitalism. And youth unemployment was off the hook. Uh, and, and the place was Washington, D.C. And the event 
was a youth lobby for jobs. And there was a coalition called the National Council for Economic Justice. And the party in the YCO, part of it, and we decided to support that youth lobby by bringing several thousand people, young people to DC to call for jobs. And I, with my know-it-all self, uh, opposed uh, that project. Well, I was in favor of bringing young people to DC to call for jobs. And I was like, lobby, really? I thought we should do something more militant, you know, a rally, sit in, occupation, demanding Congress act on new jobs legislation. But I was told that a decision had been taken and that, hey, Joe, you know, you're kind of sort of obliged to follow it. <laughs> but I replied, I wasn't part of that decision. I didn't vote for it, so why should I follow it? Um, and then the decision with the comrade I was talking to was compared to what happens in a strike, you know? Um, when the uh, vote's taken, um, everybody, is supposed to support it. Don't matter whether you just joined the union or, you know, you're not part of it yet. Um, the union takes a strike vote. Uh, everybody uh, is uh, supposed to uh, support that vote. Um, and when I heard that, um, I took a step back because I knew what a strike was. You know, I mean, I came from a family of, come from a family of steel workers. My dad, granddad, brothers worked in the mills and so on. And so you, I remember one time when we were kids, dad, uh, we had done something good. We got good grades or something. And dad had said uh, he was going to take us to, the store to get by stereo or something. And we got to the store and there was a picket line out in front. And don't you know my dad just turned that station wagon right, right around. You know, we were like, wait, 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 oh, where are you going? And he said, there's a picket line in front. I can't, I can't cross that. <laughs> but you promised, we said. And uh, he said, promise to no, I, 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 we, we're just going to have to come back. And, and, and that's exactly um, what we did. So I pulled back and supported that lobby. And don't you know, it was one of the best things we ever did at the time. Several thousand working class young people marching through DC, converging on the Capitol, going to see the members of Congress from Detroit, from Baltimore, from Philly, New York, Cleveland. I think they brought three buses from Cleveland, as I recall. It made the front page of the New York Times, Washington Post. I was wrong and the collective was right. And you know, as uh, Rosanna likes to say, if you have one opinion and your collective has another, um, you might want to just stop and uh, and uh, and uh, think about that. Um, you know, just take a self inventory and see if a mistake had been made. I mean, maybe it wasn't, but is it leaf worth uh, taking a look. But what's the lesson here? Slide, please. The lesson um, is that the Democratic uh, 
centralist principle is a principle that is drawn from the heart of the class struggle. It is a uh, principle that proceeds from the idea that everybody benefits when action is united, including those who might not agree. But even if you don't, you don't cross the picket line. In democratic centralist terms, it means you don't work against the decision. Um, at, be at worst, you don't work against the decision. And at best, you strive to carry that bad boy out. But here, we have to be careful. Because in the history of our movement, this principle has sometimes been carried out in, you know, a narrow way, you know, uh, and, and people are just expected, you know, to do. There's democratic centralism, and then there's what's called bureaucratic centralism. And in democratic centralism, the emphasis is on involvement, debate, persuasion in decision-making. In bureaucratic centralism, uh, to put it a little bit crudely, people are just either expected or told, do this, do, without that process of discussion, involvement, engagement. Um, I'm gonna say something here that might be this is my point of view. Uh, it might be wrong, but I, I think it's worth just putting it out there. Democratic centralism, in my view, must be understood as a specific feature of communist organization. In other words, it ain't for everybody. For it to work, there must be a higher level of consciousness and also a, uh, uh, a voluntary buy-in, you know? It don't necessarily apply to center-left or progressive, you know, coalitions and so on and so forth. I'll tell you a little example from my uh, student days. We, we had been in, engaged in a big struggle to get our college uh, to divest its stock portfolio and corporations investing in South Africa. And our college at that time had the largest endowment in the country. And so when it divested, uh, it had a big impact on other, you know, universities and, uh, and uh, colleges. And we won that fight. And um, uh, we were as you might imagine, very happy, heady with success. We, we, we had a big meeting of the coalition and we formed a, a, uh, a student union uh, called the Oberlin Progressive Student Union, OPSU. And, there, and this was, by the way, that South Africa campaign was initiated by a young communist at the time. We called him Yao from Philly. And, um, Yao, if you're listening, congratulations again for that effort. And there were several communist youth who were part of it. Three of us were in the YWLL, Young Workers Liberation League at the time. And, but there were also several other communist youth from other groups, probably Maoist, uh, as I recall. And they had proposed that this democratic centralist principle be applied to this student union. And it came down to a vote. And as it happened, I was the deciding vote. There were like a hundred people there and half voted yes and half minus one voted no. And I was like, and it came down to me. And I can remember just sitting there, you know, should I, shouldn't I, should I or shouldn't I? And um, I knew it was wrong, <laughs> but I voted for, <laughs> I let my leftism, you know, get 
get, get a hold of me. And um, that was the end of that coalition. All of the liberal and progressive and social democratic and whatever other kind of, they left. And, uh, and that was the, uh, that was the end of that. So that was kind of a bureaucratic action on our, on our part. So the difference between democratic and bureaucratic centralism lies in the full application of collectivity but it has to be in the appropriate organization, the appropriate time, appropriate place and in the right way. And there has to be voluntary buy-in. Let me stop there and see if uh, there are any questions about any of the above. All right, any? if you like, oh, sorry. Go ahead, man. Okay, yeah, this is Luke. If you'd like to present a, a question or a comment, uh, please click the raise hand icon, um, at which point I will unmute your mic and then you will press the red microphone button, turning it green to open the mic on your end and you will present your question. All right, uh, Lowell or Low, I don't know how to pronounce your name, Lowell Denny, uh, I'm unmuting you. Aloha, Joe. Aloha, everyone. Joe, that was, I'll be brief, that was a beautiful, succinct presentation. Um, and I hope that um, it's shared more widely than um, this webinar. I think uh, I wish I wish I had seen a presentation like that when I had joined the party. Um, very clear, the metaphor with the strike, I think it's perfect. So that's all I want to say. Thank you. Thank you, Lo. All right, I'm looking for more raised hands. Um, again, press the raised hand icon if you have a question or comment to make. All right, uh, Corinna, I am unmuting you. You can unmute yourself and uh, share your question. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, goody. This phone is erratic. Um, I have been a party member, sort of, by extension, I'm in Florida, uh, I'm 73 years old and uh, partly disabled, but I have had leftism and Marxism, socialism in my heart since I was about 15 years old. But one thing that, you know, the ideal, you know, Marxism and what I've read so far is that there's one group of people at the bottom of the barrel, and they have not been addressed by democratic socialists or even the most benevolent leftists, and that is people who aren't workers. Uh, communism, socialism addresses to the workers, but to, towards people who are disabled at the bottom of the barrel, even despised and discriminated. And I feel that a true socialist party from each according to his ability from to each according to his needs should have programs to make any government communist socialist social democratic more responsive more inclusive expansion of medicare and benevolent programs and even rehabilitation programs that there should be a top priority and a platform which has been as far as i've seen brushed aside by even the most benevolent social parties that there should be platforms and you know that there should even be strikes or movements or demonstrations equal rights housing i have been refused even the i am sitting here with a swollen mouth just because i cannot get enough dental care coverage and care credit and extension and you know just banging heads against walls and i feel that any socialist or social benevolent party should have as its platform distribution of wealth to include the disabled and rehab programs even job training as much as one can do and i don't think it ever has been part of a platform of 
any socialist, socialist workers, progressive labor party. And I don't want to sound yell and complain. I, I mean, three cheers for all that CP has been doing. But I do think that there should be that kind of inclusion. Okay, I'm done. All right, thank you very much. Joe, would you like to take one more or just get back to your presentation? Well, let's leave it there and uh, let me respond to the uh, comment and then we'll uh, continue. Well, I think it's true that uh, and this, speaking as a disabled person myself, that uh, our movement, broadly speaking, has to pay more attention to it. I don't think it's the case that we haven't paid any attention, but we certainly have to pay more because the disabled are the biggest minority in the country, actually. And uh, many of us, uh, uh, have experienced what we would call uh, special oppressions, you know, because of disability and uh, pay subminimum wages and so on and so forth. And so um, this is something that we need to pay attention to at the upcoming convention of the party, which we will have next year. We need a resolution on it. And then we have to employ democratic centralism to take initiative to make sure that that um, resolution is not just on paper, that it's given, that it's given life. And that's where democratic centralism and collectivity will come into play. So Thank you for the uh, thank you for the uh, comment. Now I'd like to turn a little bit to how the party functions as a collective, because the party, in its very essence, is an organization of collectives, and these collectives are the main form of expression of interparty democracy, and it is in them and through them that we conduct uh, the class struggle and the struggle for democracy. And that disability issue that Karina mentioned would be part of both, you know, democratic right of disabled people to have full equality. Uh, slide, please. Now, to, to participate in the party, means you participate in and through a club. And herein lies the difference between us and other organizations and movements. In other parties um, and mass movements, participation is individual, mainly. Membership at large, right? In our country, membership is tied to registering and voting. You go, you register to vote, you register as a Democrat or as God forbid, a Republican or uh, an independent and you vote. And generally that's the end of the story. Unless of course, you know, you get involved at another level. You know, you become a precinct committee person or get involved in the county organizations and, and uh, so on. And here we're, we're faced with a little conundrum because when people join our party, they come into it with the same concept of membership. I join as an individual at large, you know, pay my dues which is wonderful, we're very happy about that. You know, I write a letter, I'll go to a demonstration and that's, that's um, more or less the end of it. We've got about 6,000 members over the last couple of years, the last two years. One third of them are paying dues. Um, everybody should pay dues. But here's the thing, the at-large category of membership and participation while it exists for us should be a transitory thing. 
um, we want you to participate in an organized collective. You can find no category for at-large participation, for example, in the Constitution. And which doesn't mean you can't participate in various different ways, uh, but our goal is to move you from that state into a club, into a collective, either in person or online. And we are making more and more use of online forms of organization. Prioritizing, of course, um, in person. So, so there are two concepts of membership that we're dealing with. One is bourgeois, atomized, individual, loosely affiliating, voting. The other is proletarian, working class. You participate in an organized collective. It's organized, and our collectives are organized in a city community, in a workplace, or in a campus. And that collective becomes your center of political gravity. And you work with others in that collective to work with mass organizations, trade unions, religious, community groups, and so on, and the united front to improve the living and working conditions of, of, of the people, you know, of your town or your campus or your workplace. So to participate in the party in a full way, you have to be part of a club. In other words, a duly constituted party collective. But Joe, what do you mean by a duly constituted collective? Well, another way of saying that is, is how do you become officially recognized? And there are two ways of doing that. You either relate to an existing district where the party is already organized, and you get to know them and they get to know you and you start working as a club. Or if there is no district, you apply for recognition uh, to the national board or the national committee of the party. And in that case, you have to exist for six months have a track record, work in the community, keep you know minutes, and uh, so on and uh, so forth. Uh, and uh, that's how you you know become part of the organized uh, political and organizational expressions of the uh, party. Now we didn't just suck this concept of organization out of our thumb has a history. And this emphasis on the primacy of, of club life and party clubs has historic roots. And those roots go all the way back to the debates in the socialist movement in the early days of the last century. When in Russia, a big debate, 1903, arose in the Russian Social Democratic Party about uh, what became a very profound political question. And that profound political question was, what is a member? And Lenin and them said, you got to be a member of a club. And those who opposed uh, that position said, eh, not so much. You just be at large, you know? You do you. Uh, you come around and when you can. And uh, Lenin and them were, well, were interested in, in forming something different. And that something different was a fighting organization. And, and and the and the the thing that gave life to that fight was the catalytic force that I talked about was uh, participating in an organized collective with other organized collectives, you know, in a democratic centralist way. 
The people who won that debate were called Bolsheviks. That means majority in Russian. And those who were on the losing side of that debate were called Mensheviks. And that means minority in, in uh, Russian. So the, for us, the party club is the primary form of collective organization for people who are at large. And there are many of us, many of you, uh, we, we, we want you to become involved in organized collective so that you can express your full strength and uh, conviction. Are there any questions about the foregoing? All right, once again, just uh, press the raised hand button and uh, I will call on you, at which point you will open your mic on your end and I will open your mic on my end and you'll be able to pose your question. Uh, I'm going to call on Alexis. I'm opening your mic now. There you Hi, go. yes. Can you hear me? Yep. Perfect. Okay. Um, I don't know if this is the appropriate place to ask this question, but um, I'm also in Florida. Hi, Corinne. <laughs> um, and I don't see that there's a chapter in Orlando. I'm curious if maybe I'm just missing something or what steps I would need to take to potentially open a chapter in that location. Um, again, if I need to ask this elsewhere, please let me know. Thank you so much. All right. Um, Virginia, I am unmuting you. You can open your mic and pose your question. Virginia, um, your hand is raised. I've opened your mic. You can unmute yourself on your end to pose your question. Looks like that may not be working. I'm um, sorry, are you talking to me? Oh yeah, there you go. I'm sorry. I was, uh, I didn't have a question. I was just trying to find a little button so I knew how to raise my hand. I am listening intently. I'm uh, sorry. I'm just listening. Right. Thank you. We'll return it to Joe. Or we have uh, another question now. Uh, Kazu, I am opening your mic. Kazu, if you can uh, unmute yourself, you can um, pose your question. There you go. OK, um, Joe, thank you very much. Uh, it's, uh, I really like the way you're doing this uh, class. I, uh, the, I have found that when new people come into a club, the, hard, the hardest thing at the beginning is explaining and uh, getting people to understand democratic centralism and I'm hoping now that I understand it better the way you explain it I'm hoping that I can get the membership committee to emphasize this if they haven't already to new members and then new member uh, classes and meetings because it's um, one of the most important parts of being in the party. Um, and often I have people begin to just do their own thing, thinking that a Democrat or whatever, and they just say, well, this person is really good. And I keep trying to explain that it's important for people to come back to a club meeting and talk about who they would like to back in an election before they join that organization. Um, and I think this is going to help uh, those of us on execs or help to explain to people, new members, how uh, we think and how we make decisions. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you, Kazu. Yeah. 
uh, Comrade uh, Alexa. No, every getting more organized is always uh, appropriate. And we're in the course of reorganizing the party in Florida. And if you write to me at Joe Sims, J O E S I M S, at cpusa.org, we'll put you in contact with the party organizer in Florida. His name is John Streeter, and we'll get you uh, connected. There may not be a club in your particular neck of the woods, but um, there is a way for you to participate, even if it's online. Um, and, that's, and that's important. So my email is J-O-E-S-I-M-S -S at cpusa.org. And if anybody else has questions that are not answered, please feel free to uh, reach out. So the point that we were making is, is, is that the club is the hub, or should be the hub. And by the way, I'm talking about ideals here. And you know, what we're striving to be, it's not always the case, as the party's in the process of rebuilding and reestablishing collective forms of organization. Uh, and um, uh, we're not uh, the party we we want to be, we're in the process of becoming, you know? So so keep that in, in mind. Party's the hub, it should be the center of, the, of our political life. Um, and it should be the, the a place where the party's policies and ideas are tested in real life, right? It should be the point of connection between the us and the broader working class movement. And that's a point of connection that should be constantly tested and evaluated in the club and between the club and the district leadership. Um, is the club's coalition work on housing or strike support or fighting police violence or fundraising? Uh, or table, is it effective? What needs to be improved? Uh, should it be abandoned and something new be undertaken? And so on and so forth. And there should be a constant ongoing feedback loop or interaction between the club and its leadership and elected district collectives. And that feedback loop is really, if you think about it, is part of the very essence of what collectivity should be, and that should be a two-way street. Clubs should help shape district policy and vice versa. And the district should come and assist the club and provide uh, leadership. And this is important because otherwise the party has the appearance of being top down. And that sometimes happens. And in fact, someone I know and respect very much a wonderful comrade said to me recently, he said, Joe, the party's top down, ain't it? I was, you know, a little surprised when, when, when they said that. But when that happens, it means that something is amiss. It means that bureaucratic tendencies are starting to seep in. Um, for real collectivity to occur, it takes a lot of work. I mean, it does, you know, and, and you should resist taking shortcuts. You just can't decide on an initiative and expect everybody to follow it. And that happens. Prior to the decision, you, 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 you got to hold discussions with people. Buy-in has to be achieved. Comrades have to feel and in fact, participate in it from the ground floor. And then even after the decision has been made, leadership has to go back and forth and help plan how to implement it. You just can't assume everybody knows how to do it. In fact, our leadership has come to the conclusion that we've made too many assumptions about that, you know, that everybody knows how to. and. This is a new party we are building, and uh, including with some of the people who have been been around for a while. 
Um, and then there's the issue of how to involve people who weren't at the meeting. In any collective, you know, there are people who come regularly and then there are some who don't come so much. But do we ever ask why? You know, are they people with children? You know, are they working two or three jobs? Uh, is there any effort to reach out, discuss, and involve them as well? If they're young people uh, and they get invited and they don't show, do we take the time to figure out why? And then there's the gender issue, the race issue, uh, the uh, uh, sexual orientation consideration as well. Are we including these folks? Do we take extra measures to do so? And if not, why not? In other words, which is not to say that, you know, just uh, our folks, these folks are not participating, no. But if the, it, it does include them, are we sensitive to that? Um, in other words, do we fight for Black, Latino, women, LGBTQ leadership? This is a major question, you know, where we have leadership in, in communities that in an organization that is predominantly white. And there are bound to be influences of racism and sexism, homophobia. I mean, after all, we live in, you know, modern day U.S. state monopoly capitalism and the period of its decline. Um, and, and to be effective, those influences have to be addressed by a collective. Addressing them have to have a force of the collective. In other words, if these problems develop, it can't be understood. Like say you have a black or Latino chair or a woman chair and there's a, a chauvinistic response or a sexist response. You can't deal with it as a one-on-one -on -one issue. As a personal issue, no, it's political. And the offended party cannot be made to shoulder, shoulder the burden. The collective has to deal with it, or better yet, a subcommittee of that collective. Influences of racism, sexism, homophobia cannot be fought, in my opinion, effectively outside of a collective. But it's also the case that these problems just can't be dumped into the collective without adequate preparatory work. Many times it's appropriate to form smaller subcommittees, you know, to meet and discuss, make recommendations. Keeping in mind, and this is so important, that our goal has to be to help comrades improve, grow. You know, we're not trying to kick everybody out who makes a racist or chauvinistic or sexist uh, because if we did that, we wouldn't have too many people, to be to be honest, you know. Because the, the influences are ever present. The question is not whether or not they're influenced. The question is both for us as individuals and the collective is: Are we aware of them and are we vigilant and do we struggle against them daily, hourly, you know? So the point I'm trying to make is that collectivity requires work, patience, and more work. Uh, but when it's properly undertaken, a high level of unity is achieved and decision-making then is largely by consensus. Not always, but largely. And many times, a lack of cons consensus Conversely, signifies a gap in collectivity. 
Uh, any questions about any of that? All right, once again, just click the raised hand button to uh, indicate that you have a question or comment, at which point I will uh, call your name, open the mic on my end, and you can open your mic on your end to pose your question. Doesn't look like there are any questions presently, if you just want to keep it going, Joe. Okay. So, um, now there are other forms of collective decision making in the uh, a party, while the club is the primary form, there are others. A slide. And, and because the party is a very democratic, small d democratic organization, I got to always make sure to say small d. And even when I say small d, sometimes people don't understand that. They, they think I'm talking about the Democratic Party. <laughs> and I'm not. I'm talking about democracy, advanced democracy. <laughs> um, but because the party is a very democratic organization, uh, these other forms are all elected or constituted by elected bodies. Um, they include club execs, uh, which are elected at an annual club conference where a plan of work is approved. Uh, and by the way, that's a constitutional issue. Constitutions of every club every year should have a club conference that uh, works on a plan of work and elects, refreshes its leadership Sometimes comrades confuse that and they say, yo, guys, sisters, siblings, we just had comrades, we just had a uh, uh, state convention. But they're confusing a convention and a, a, a conference. And I'll talk about the uh, difference in just a moment. Club conference every year with a plan of work. And you need a plan of work because you need to decide what offices you need based on that plan, you know. Clubs uh, come together every four years in a district convention. And that's part of the difference between a conference and a convention. Uh, the, 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 the clubs, uh, several clubs come together every four years, generally. And they elect a district committee. And that district committee is responsible for the direction of the party between conventions, right? And the purpose of the, of the district convention is twofold. Number one, to, uh, at least from an electoral point of view, to elect a district committee. And the secondly, to elect delegates to uh, who are nominated to the national convention. Uh, that's the purpose of a uh, district convention. The, the national convention is constituted by delegates from clubs that are elected at district conventions. In fact, the only way, and this is important, to uh, participate in the national convention and vote is if you are elected at a district or club convention. End of story, period. That's a constitutional issue. You can come as a guest, you know, if invited, but you uh, don't have voting power. And, and that's the difference. The National Convention is the highest decision-making body of the party. It decides on policy and elects a national committee, uh, which is responsible for direction uh, between conventions. The election to the National Committee is a very important event in the life of the party, and it is 
consultant, there's a very dynamic and active back and forth between clubs and district leaderships and district conventions and the national committee and national board about what that national committee should look like because the national committee in the first place is a political body you know uh its responsibility is political ideological leadership um maintaining the party maintaining its platform program you know deepening it and so on but within the context of that we have to take into account class composition gender race uh, geographic representation so on and so forth and so and that's a very rigorous process that takes place prior uh, to the uh, convention the national committee then elects a board other officers to carry out its work um, you can see that on the uh, chart the convention at the top national committee below that the national board so on and uh, so so forth um, the board and national committee then is tasked with constituting collectives to assist it to carry out its work we call these collectives commissions and departments the org department you see that on the left uh, the ed department labor commission international department and these bodies are constituted with uh, approval by the uh, nc by vote last point i want to make here is that the policies and i hope i'm not boring y'all but this is a little bit tedious but we're coming up to convention next year and it's important for us to have a sense of you know what the what the procedures are and how inter-party democracy looks as we begin that process in fact we're having a meeting of the national committee in a couple of weeks and we'll inaugurate that uh, that uh, process for the uh, convention next year the policies and politics of a convention are shaped by resolutions uh, by clubs by other elected collectors by commissions they set the stage for a four-month pre-convention period where the parties work its political line are discussed in various manners in writing and club meetings and national meetings and webinars district conventions if necessary we make special forums for discussion create websites if we need it print publications if we need that and uh, so on and uh, so forth so the purpose of that national convention is to uh, evaluate our work assess it deepen it uh, and number one at the political ideological side and then to refresh the uh, leadership uh, on the other side so um i want to make a few points here uh, and try try to hear me out with respect to the party and its a structure and the relationship between clubs and districts uh, in the national organization so we can see that the party has a tiered structure uh, i mean the, the graph shows the convention at the top uh, and then the clubs below uh, but there's a reciprocal relationship actually that goes from the club to the district to the convention and then from the convention to the clubs governed by uh, uh, between conventions by the national committee which is the overall leading body at the national level and then district committees in each uh, existing district of the party 
elected district collectives are politically responsible for what occurs in the party in their areas of jurisdiction in their district. New York party is responsible for New York. Ohio party responsible, Ohio, Southern California, and so on and so forth. Clubs, according to our structure, operate solely and exclusively within the framework of their particular district. Our structure does not envision cross-club interaction outside of their districts unless it's consulted with the leadership of the other district. The existence of social media doesn't change that. Why? The main reason is that political leadership in the party uh, for democracy to work must come from the elected leading collector. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Say a, a, a club in state X should contact a club in state Y <laughs> about a project issue. Um, and the leadership in Club Y don't know nothing about it. And what if the leadership in Y doesn't agree with the initiative? They say, wait, 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 hold up, y'all. We have a plan of work. And we're not being dogmatic about our plan, but shouldn't we at least be consulted before you? Because this kind of falls outside of that plan. You see the problem? Contacts between individuals, clubs, and districts, therefore, must go through the responsible elected collectives. And that applies to everybody. Yours truly included, Rosanna included, members of the national board included. Look, if an individual in District V, let's say Vermont, V for Vermont, has a petition on an issue or wants to circulate a pamphlet or, or, or say they have a, a, a reading list or a campaign, it first should be consulted with the leadership of their district and through that leadership with the appropriate national collective and then with the con contact the leading collective in another district. Even the national committee must take care not to sidestep district leaderships in pursuit of national goals. For example, it would be a mistake for the national committee to contact club B, number B, um, in district C about setting a fund drive goal for the PW and go around the district leadership. You know? I mean, uh, because that district leadership in all likelihood has already talked with their clubs about what their goals would be. So we would be really amiss to go in and say, no, to that club, your fund drive goal should be not what something else. Oh, we would be in a whole heap of trouble if we pulled something like that. That would be an example of a bureaucratic error. And we say that even though the party is not a federated body, it's not composed of independent districts, everybody is responsible to the national committee. Uh, but you can't approach that in a mechanical uh, a way. Um, the point here is that collectivity requires consultation, talking to the appropriate bodies, not taking shortcuts because not to do so breeds factionalism. And what is factionalism? Simply put, 
Factionalism is operating outside of elected uh, collectives in pursuit of political goals. Any questions about uh, the preceding? All right, just click the raised hand icon to raise your hand and I will call on you and open your mouth. All right, Matthew, I'm opening your mic. Please open it on your end. There you go, there you go. Hello, can you hear me okay? Yep, yep. Okay, uh, my question is, I would fall under the, the members at large category um, because where I'm at in East Central Georgia, it's very, very red. Um, would a virtual collective be more appropriate until maybe either a regional or a local club could get up and going? Thank you. All right. Um, Alexis, I am unmuting you. Thank you, Luke. Um, so I think I have a couple of questions. My first of which being, we're all familiar with campaign season for Democrats and Republicans as things stand currently. Um, is there kind of like a campaign season for district committee, national committee elections? Um, and then also regarding the uh, conventions themselves, I know you mentioned the one that's happening next year. I'm just curious um, how often conventions happen and if we can expect them to be more commonly digital now with the COVID pandemic still ongoing, or if we can expect to start seeing some in-person events like that as well. Uh, that's it. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, that seems to be all the raised hands. Joe, if you want to continue. Okay. Well, Matthew, we're very happy to have you. Um, um, we know what it's like to live in red areas. I'm from Ohio. It used to be blue, but now it's red. At least some people think it is. I was listening to the former governor, Kasich. He said, wait, 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 not so fair. He's a Republican. He said, in places like Youngstown, Cleveland, Akron, I'm not so sure. They voted that way because they got disappointed in the uh, NAFTA and Trans Pacific Partnership and all that stuff. But that don't necessarily mean they're going to stay that way. And Georgia's changing too. And um, and uh, they're doing a good job down there and struggling for voting rights and abortion rights and uh, uh, against the forces of the extreme right. And we got a new club in Atlanta. So if you write to me at the address or write to Rosanna, uh, at membership at cpusa.org, uh, we can help you think through what's the what's the best way to proceed, whether it's to connect with the Atlanta Club or some other uh, way. I'm not exactly for sure of the other groups that are forming, but virtually, certainly would be a, a option. Um, and Alexis. Uh, well, that campaign season, as you call it, is what we call the pre-convention period. And it officially opens four months before the convention. It's a four month period constitutionally mandated. That'll be next year uh, at the beginning of the year. Say the convention's in June, it'll be four months before June. What is that, February? Um, and, uh, and that's when we begin to refresh you know, our leaderships. Sometimes the district leaderships are elected before the convention. Sometimes the conventions are held in two parts, you know. You just deal with the politics first part and then leadership issues afterwards. So it kind of depends. And we're trying to hold, um, you're right, the pandemic ain't over, but we're trying to hold uh, our goal is to have this convention in person this time around, but safely. And uh, so that's uh, uh, our 
objective. Um, so, a word about social media and collectivity. Social media provides rich opportunities for greater collectivity. You know, it's clear, signal, Black, WhatsApp, Twitter, Instagram, Discord, and so on, as you know, uh, widely used now for posting events, organizing, even discussion. And as you also know, what comes with it are positives and negatives, you know? On the positive side, you know, it's an open platform. Contact is instantaneous, encrypted, providing for safe and secure communication. On the negative tip, um, I also think, as most of us know, there are pitfalls, you know. Among them are toxic discussions, name calling, rumors, spreading of rumors, unsubstantiated with the speed of light, along with the utilization of online spaces for that funky kind of organizing that I was talking about. So we have to uh, collectively think through how to put together guidelines and rules of the road to make maximum use of the advantages and minimize the disadvantages. And, uh, and then when we make them, we should follow them, you know, because sometimes we make guidelines, but then something happens and somebody gets a little, you know, come, gets a little bit out of pocket and you get mad and then you boom, you, and the test of, you know, the test of collectivity, comrades, it's not when things are easy, it's when they become contentious that you have to really fight for greater collect calmness, sobriety, objectivity, and all of those kinds of things, you know? Uh, that's when the uh, rubber uh, hits the road. Well, for the last hour, comrades, we've been uh, talking about collectivity and democratic sense as it applies to our internal functioning. Uh, now I want to talk a little bit about how it applies to our external uh, functioning. Um, it's used by the working class and people's movement. And I would subsume all of this under the concept of collective action by our class and people. Uh, this is uh, particularly important considering we're on the verge of an extremely important national election next year. And I'd like to present it within the framework of making political choices about governing political choices about governing. We already established that in bourgeois society, voting, like belonging to a political party, is presented as an act by an atomized individual. You know, once again, um, uh, voting is, like belonging to that party, is presented as making a political choice uh, uh, by a atomized individual. Every voting cycle, you go into the ballot box, you pencil in who you like, you don't pencil who you don't like, leave that blank. Your choice is governed by program, personality, or an issue like abortion, or the death penalty, or the environment, or collective bargaining, war, peace, you know. And now the talking heads are trying to make it about age. You know, that's they say that's the main thing now. Uh, but is that what's really happening? Is it really about individual choices? Slide, please. I mean, 
there is um, voting is a mass phenomenon. Uh, something like 154.6 million people voted in the last presidential election. And much of that vote, is a slide up, uh, uh, was organized by religious institutions, uh, by community groups, uh, by, uh, by uh, uh, churches. Um, uh, businesses, labor, labor unions, you name it. In other words, it's a collective action. Uh, whether you realize it or not, you're taking action in concert with tens of millions of other people. And yeah, one side, on the one side, there's an element of one's freedom of choice and secret ballot. That's true. But on the other side, there's the element of acting together with others in pursuit of common goals. Goals like uh, just the last 15 and 20 years, electing the first black president or the electing the first woman president, or electing the first gay president. How about one day soon, the electing of the first worker president? Uh, or how about this, electing the first communist president, right? That's what I'm talking about, first communist worker president. I want to live to see that day. And in order for that to happen, uh, it's necessary to break through a number of illusions or mystifications about voting. Slide. Among them uh, is uh, the three illusions or mystifications. One is that your vote don't count. Tell you your vote, it don't matter. Your, my vote don't count. And that's true if you're acting alone. But if you're acting as part of a collective action, it counts big time. Um, slide. Another mystification is that it doesn't affect you or those around you. You know, eh, it don't matter. Tell that to a woman living in a state where now there's a Supreme Court decision. They can't have an abortion. They got to travel. And they're trying to track that now. Well, tell that to a person on food stamps and raise the age by five years, requiring you work 20 hours a week for the equivalent of $6 a day in a country where the minimum wage is, is $7.25 an hour. It don't matter. A third illusion and this is a big one on the left, is that, oh, I'm going to stay pure. I'm not going to get my hands dirty by lining up with one of them bourgeois, warmongering candidates, you know? I ain't trying to do that. I want to abstain this time around, you know? But hey, Bourgeois politics, is, politics by definition is dirty. I mean, uh, and, and not voting, I mean, it's dirty. And not voting or casting a protest vote is just as much an action as voting. It is. You know, um, and and uh, 
you know, if you want to fight in a country like that, you got to get in the mud and wrestle. You do. I mean, it's uh, we have to understand what we're wrestling up against, you know. It reminds me of the words of the great poet who, who, who was talking about people who, who wanted to be pure, you know. And that poet said, those who fear the bad taste of things will fail. And those of us who are afraid, are afraid to get busy, to get in the mud and wrestle and fight the class and democratic struggle, uh, with the tools that we have available, we'll fail too. The working class understands the importance of collective action. It emerges almost spontaneously out of the process of production. Yeah, you're compelled to associate, to combine, to collectively bargain if you want to survive. It emerges out of the lives of Black folk, Latino, Asian, women, LGBTQ. Me Too was a magnificent example of collective action, as was the BLM uprising, slide. And the truth of the matter is that despite the illusions, it is only through collective action that one's personal freedom, and I want y'all to hear me on this, and choices, whether it be by voting, whether it be voting, personal choice to vote, who you vote for, or your abortion rights, a choice between you and your doctor, or being able to find a goddamn book in a school library is only through collective action that that can be guaranteed. An atomized, isolated individual don't stand a chance, not up against a ruling class like this, when the capitalist state organized the way they organize it. So that's our presentation. I think we got eight minutes for any other questions or comments that people want to say, and then we'll have to leave. Thank you for participating. All right. Um, looking for raised hands, just click that raised hand icon to indicate that you have a question or comment, at which point I will open your mic and then you will open your mic on your end. Uh, I'm going to call on Yugo. Uh, your mic is open. Hello, uh, you thank go. you. Um, so my question is uh, just about the electoral strategy. Uh, I'm not sure if this is the right forum, uh, but I guess my question is where where there is uh, ranked choice voting and we don't ha run into the danger of being a spoiler and getting a Republican or fascist elected, would it be a good idea to, to run candidates under the Communist Party in, in these kind of elections and in elections where the districts deem it safe, I suppose, but in, in red districts where the Democrats are not competitive at all, uh, where we can go and campaign and, con and contrast ourselves, the Republicans, directly to the workers um, in that area. But but then, of course, all, you know, support Democrats, uh, ultimately, you know, in the, where that's appropriate and, you know, creates uh, a safer space for us to organize and do our work in. Good question. Thank you. Um... I will call on Yazoo. I'm opening your mic now. Sorry, one second. All right. Uh, looks like I'm unable to unmute you at the moment. Um, 
Alan, I'm unmuting you. Yes. Um, <clears throat> my question was, in the next year's election, will there be any CP members running for city, county, or state elections anywhere? And if so, will we get the address so we can donate to their campaign? Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to try one more time to unmute uh, Yazoo. And still showing that your mic is muted. Very sorry about that. Um, Joe, would you like to respond to those questions? Uh, sure. Well, Hugo, um, it's a good question. We want communist candidates, you know? Uh, we've been saying that for a while, and, and uh, some are running, you know, um, city council, uh, school boards, you know, um, and uh, that kind of thing. And we're beginning to have some people joining uh, who have experience in running campaigns. In fact, I had a conversation just, uh, I think, on Thursday with a young woman who was a campaign manager for a winning candidate here in New York. Uh, and so the answer is, where appropriate, yes, because, you know, uh, you learn everything that you need to know when you run a political campaign about organizing fundraising, you learn how to write press releases, you learn how to be on camera, you learn how to build coalitions, most importantly. Um, all of those different kinds, and, and, and these are skills that, that, that you need to uh, know. And should we get elected, uh, get lucky and, and get elected, we'll, 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 we'll learn the rules about governing. So yes, in cases where you know you're not going to elect a fascist, hell yeah, we should try to run. No question about it. And the more that uh, we have, the uh, uh, better. And um, and with respect to the second question, we'll see. We we hope uh, to have candidates. We we want those candidates. Uh, because it will help us in in party building, you know, and and that's the goal, you know. We we we're facing a situation where on the one side we have to prevent the fascists from coming to power and a dictatorship. You see what happened on January the sixth. But on the other side, we want to build the party and we want to build the united working class and people's movement, you know. Um, and so we're trying to manage those two tensions, uh, and it's a little, there are tensions, but we think we're doing it, um, in a responsible way. Um, because, you know, key to winning socialism is building the political independence of the working class. And therefore, when we work in bourgeois elects, we work with the independent forces around the issue of around issues with trade unions, because they have their own separate independent structure and other mass and community organizations. Uh, so we're working on it. Uh, we don't have a list yet, but we'll see how it goes as the summer and fall develops. Comrades, thank you so much for listening. Just to restate some of the main points of my presentation, I have a minute. Collectivity is the uh, catalytic force that brings together all of the elements of the uh, a party. It takes uh, shape and form in the, uh, 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 in the democratic application of the democratic centralist principle. Democratic centralism for us means all for one. It means collective discussion, collective decision-making, collective action. It's a principle that is born out of the heart of the 
class struggle it basically means you don't cross the picket line once you make a decision uh, we are a party of collectives the main collective is the club membership is largely not completely but largely defined by being in a club uh, and within that club collectivity is so key don't make individual decisions always talk to your collective it's hard work don't take shortcuts our collectives are uh, mainly elected you know there's a process for doing in that and that the process of change takes place through uh, collective action by our class and voting marches occupations are all forms of that collective action and voting is one of the most important thank you very much uh, and now there's a lunch break now and Nita is holding forth next in an hour. Please come back, take care, stay strong, stay safe, uh, and uh, thanks for participating this morning.